what I like to talk to you about today is uh, we did a book and I was a scientific advisor for this book and it was a three year research on ICT and local governance in Africa. Uh, as you know, many African countries do not have any strategy for local government improvement and particularly on local government services for ordinary people. There isn't. Usually they have very good documents at the highest level, at the national level, at the political level, at the policy level, but not at the practical level where actually ordinary people live. So that was uh, the real thing. And I was very uh, challenged by this. And we, we ran the program for three years. IDRC, the, uh, the Canadian research organization, funded it. And we were able to generate this book. And I wrote the foreword for this book. And I hope uh, I sent it to you. They will have an e-book. I hope all of you will have a chance to read it because I'm not going with all God's will in my heart, I will not be able to tell you everything we did in about 20 minutes. So I, I, with humility, I present myself to you and I'll say a little bit of what I'm going to do. Please. <laughs> Can you confirm that the book will be made available so the digital copy of the book will be available? Yes. All yes. the things. Okay, you will find, we'll make available to our website. It could, it could be in the website and there's an e-book. It's, uh, we, uh, we apply what we call intellectual philanthropy. We do not apply intellectual property. That's my condition. I do not like to control knowledge. I like to share knowledge. I like to distribute it. Thank you. So, right. Now, can we please, you have somebody help me? I have a few things for you in inspiration, introducing the login research. Uh, the model of uh, E and H governance. I was quite struck by uh, India because the Supreme Court of India passed a law which says no Indian should go hungry. This is not a crime. A crime of the state of India if one person, if this poor person can take the court, the, the state of court, which is very difficult. That's what it is. It's a very interesting moral sentiment that, that, that India has expressed. But you were telling me earlier on in the telecenter that there are all these entrepreneurs. There, are, there aren't that many entrepreneurs in Africa or in India. There are tenderpreneurs. You know, they, they, they get linkages, corrupt practices that make it rather difficult to actually say they actually do things that are quite honest and business-centered, as well as service-centered. Those are the problems we have in Africa. And at the local level, they do. And I was just, I didn't get a chance to ask a question, but I think the tenderpreneur is a big problem in Africa. I don't know about whether it's here in, in, in Italy or anywhere else, but in, in Africa, we have these kind of problems where relationships aren't honest and based on rules and norms. And they are based on some other relationships. So I'm going to do the model and uh, governance, which is e-governance and e-government and human governance and human government. Some of our findings in the future research. Please. Yes, please. Yes. yes. There is a very interesting, uh, Stiglitz is a, uh, uh, an economist, is a <coughs> Nobel Prize winner. He says there is a natural asymmetry of information to those who govern and those whom they are supposed to serve. This is a big problem in Africa. Please, just this up. E-governance is never going to be really effective unless it is tied very closely with the right to information. On the other hand, right to information is not going to be very successful and in fact a failure if it's not tied with the concept of e-governance. This is the chief information Officer of India. Please. It is possible to assess the status of a given country by creating a composite index comprising the World Measure Index, the Telecommunications Infrastructure Index, the Human Capital Index, and the E Preparation Index. 
this is a very interesting point, what we were talking last night. The broadband, that connectivity is very important. But if you take much of Africa, we have a problem. For example, South Africa spends more money on nanotechnology than it spends on ICT. It's extraordinary. It's, uh, it's happening. They do research on material science, advanced material science, than they do on infrastructure. Of course, there's mobile telephony spending around the world, but then that mobile telephone is limited. For example, you can download certain things, but not, depending on the connectivity. Continue, please. It is possible to implement e-governance. Wes, please, go back. It is possible to implement e-governance without necessarily having a decentralization policy. This is uh, the author of this book. This is quite interesting because in the African context, it isn't simply a question of decentralizing, centralizing, and so on, and then applying. It's different. It's good to decentralize. It's probably better. But it's not necessarily the case that it's, it solves problems. Very, the very fact of administrative uh, decentralization, please. Now, the serious look at research, this research, we had 10 countries that were involved. These 10 countries had these characteristics. Least income, middle income, lower middle income, upper middle income, higher middle income. The higher income countries, for example, South Africa. All right. The lower income country is some, some, a country like Ethiopia. Then you have Uganda, you have Kenya, you have Ghana, uh, Ghana is in the upper middle income. You have different types of countries that are relatively small, but the middle income and income is given, for example, if you take the United States, people who earn more than 10,000 are considered almost like the poverty line. If you take a country like Italy, similar, the standard is similar. If a person is 10,000 or so, so he's poor. <laughs> but if you, if you take a country like uh, Ethiopia, if somebody gets 800, very good. You understand? They have different ratios, uh, relationships of how you classify countries and their income levels. But these are the countries that were taken. So in terms of the way the countries were chosen, it was chosen not by a design of saying, let's take the least income countries got a category. Let's take the middle income categories and the higher income categories. They were mixed. And number two, the researchers were also mixed. So what we have is we have, for example, Senegal, but the Senegal group, the research group, had to drop out because when we do the evaluation, scientific evaluation, peer review evaluation, they couldn't stand up, measure up. The amount of work they were doing, the kind of thing they were trying to do, we couldn't, so they dropped out. Eventually, we managed to get nine countries to participate, but among the nine countries, for example, Mauritius, the result we got from Mauritius wasn't that good, for example. Uh, and a number of other countries wasn't that, like that, but some of the other countries were very good. So they, what we then had was these various countries not only have different incomes, they have different e ratings You know, the, how prepared are they? Um, they were all researched into the local areas. The funding was from IDRC, the team leader was from Kenya, the scientific advisors were uh, myself and somebody from the United States. All right, continue. Now, e-government side exhibitions, what were the outputs? We had exhibitions in Cairo and Mauritius, open to the public, workshops every year from Cairo, Nairobi, and Mauritius, policy makers and ICT service providers were invited, demonstration of some of the e-government promoting schemes developed in the research, some actual practical things that governments pick up were uh, demonstrated. A final conference was, was held in, in Cairo. Books came out, scientific papers came out. A roadmap of how we can develop further e-governance was developed. And how to expand future research that includes many African countries and others uh, is included. And I would like to invite you, invite Italy to join in the silver. She's wonderful, she writes papers in for our journal of African science technology, and I'm going to invite you for more things, because you're energetic and good and strong. I like younger, energetic people to support us. I want Italy to support positively Africa. You need to put Africa first in order to put humanity first.
We don't want to, any human community should never, never experience what Africa went through. If you do that, you then say, no human community should go experience what Africa went through, means humanity first is Africa first. A young person like you should put Africa first. Very good. So you should get involved with us. Many countries in the study do not have an e-governance policy. Nearly all of them in the study have national e-governance strategies and policies. That's a very interesting thing. No, no local government policy. By conducting this research, the locality was highly highlighted. Linking the local with the national in Africa was encouraged to draw lessons from good and fair practice to promote e-governance. Continue. So we now made a model, at least this is it, distinction between government and governance, between human government and human go uh, uh, governance, I'm sorry about that, between e-government, governance, and human governance, between e-government and human governance, between edge government and e-governance, combining e and edge government with e and edge governance. The interesting question is, when you do this kind of things, which one delivers better? What is government and governance? The main, the simple distinction is this. Government is making sure that all the bureaucracies, the administrative systems, work efficiently. They provide the public services they say they would, and with all the rules that they say they would, deliberately and, and, and conclusively. Governance is relationship between this government with citizens, with the people. The degree to which the citizens feel that services are being provided to them, the degree to which accountability, participation are encouraged, that government is not discouraged or does not lie, but it actually delivers, is a very interesting question. This is where the model is continuing. So you have, uh, the interesting idea is that if you have e-governance and edge government, e-government, what we want is to, as much as possible, to, to make e-government exist strongly, but deliver as much of uh, human governance as possible. That is the kind of thing that uh, we thought might be very good to do. Continue. So we want uh, e-governance to be uh, is very desired. At the moment, we have a lot of uh, human governance, and we have uh, e-government, and we would need to make sure that we get the balance right. And mainly, the more e-governance is developed, the less corruption, the less uh, misgovernment can occur, is the assumption. So this is a build on that. Continue. Context for e-governance matters. It matters where Africa is today, the government, e governance index. It matters very much which area of the world e-governance is applied. If it's a, a, small, a country like Africa, where you have rent-seeking behavior, where uh, tender entrepreneurs, rather than entrepreneurs exist, we have all kinds of difficult situations, then you do need to underscore the, the, the very fact of uh, the context of Africa in the governance picture. In Africa, in general, more E is seen to make government function better, govern, governance to improve, more human is seen to retain corruption, more E is seen to reduce it. Of course, more empirical research is required to prove it, but this is the kind of thing we are going to continue. So some of the findings from this book is that given this model, we say specific to each country and policy impact, what is, what is, what is the specific thing that this study did that was able to be translated into the policy. In other words, how did government people were approached and what did they take from it? So I'll give you a few examples. There was something called the UNDP's indicators. All of you know it, yes? It's about participation, accountability, responsiveness, equity, efficiency, rule of law, transparency, and so on. This is the UNDP. They are very good at putting in these interesting words. And so there it is. But that was taken also for this study, and each uh, country was also allocated. So we, I then put the shared challenges and ideas forward, continue. Now, 
the specific success, a few examples. From Ethiopia, the, stu the study on life uh, cycle events showed from the study, this is what the government learned. They asked for the source code and manuals to implement services at the local government level. In other words, the study was not just shared in the, book, the library, actually they took it up, the local government took it up. The same thing from Morocco, local governments allocated budgets to implement an electronic civil registration system. That's another very good success. Kenya was however consigned to the workshop to get higher officials buy into the study. Not very good. South Africa reported workshop to encourage buy-in. Not very good. Mauritius got more business buy-in, not government buy-in. Reported 107 businesses bought into it. Uh, Egyptians did develop the business process mapping methodology this, in this research and the government adopted it. That was the most successful. The, the government adopted the result of the research from Egypt. I think that is what happened. Continue. But the UNDP, I just mentioned this, this is the, this study was also done for each country, but the result again is mixed. Continue. What I then say is, let me just, the shared recommendation that all of them came through. Development of e-government and e-governance policy for local government. Less awareness for the local must change. In other words, not just for policy for the larger, but make sure you also make it specific and you will do, see the bottom of the pyramid. More African countries must be included. The research must continue, but must also be relevant. Need for North Africa research to be critical. So continue. So future research, we need to combine ISD for development with science, technology, innovation for development, this kind of work we do. We have been running this journal for the last three years. I think it should continue. And we also develop a doctoral program, research program, for the doctoral academy where we include ICT for development with SDI for development in Africa. So we're going to run the next one in Nairobi. Uh, we include civil society researchers with university, with north, with south, medics, my brother, where is he? Roberto. He's not here. Okay. Now, Roberto is a very dynamic Italian. He's, uh, I met him some eight, nine years ago in Shinghua University, where I was teaching at a doctoral academy in China. <laughs> and he's been with since then, we have been brothers, very genuine brothers, very good brothers. And he, we, we, I helped him a little bit, but I think he did most of it. We set up the Medalix area. In other words, this is to make Italy a very powerful country in the North Africa, uh, Middle East, and and Southern Europe. And he's amazing. You really should see him. I think he's, you should give him a clap. Actually, he's a very 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 nice guy. And he's doing good work. And also Silvia and all the other people are doing good work. And I think we should encourage them. And I like to encourage them. We have the Medalix. Uh, we also include doctor and postdoctor researchers. I have uh, lots of postdoctor researchers. I have five researchers in South Africa working with me. Um, I've got two more. South Africa gave me two more. So I have more researchers. When you finish, you can come to South Africa and do research. Those kinds of things. We can do that more. We collaborate. We do research together. We do it. Yeah? We get southern from Italy, they go to South Africa or Africa. And from Africa, they come to Italy. And the Mediterranean area, they connect. They do different things. Then more understanding is great. We connect Israel with Iran. This kind of thing. Iran is involved, Turkey is involved in this, in this unit. So this kind of thing. Continue. We can include something called Globalix. We have uh, Globalix. It's another network we started about 10 years ago with some uh, friends. We again get south, south, north, researchers uh, here. There are, for example, in Italy, uh, Franco Malerba, there's also uh, Giovanni Dossi, those kinds of people that are good friends of mine who are also involved in this. We have uh, the African Globalist Academy, we have Next Global, we have the journals, as I said, we have workshops mainly in Africa, Asia, Latin America. We could be inclusive, we could be smart, and we can make sustainable research with relevance. Let's continue. 
So each of advanced research must be led by practice. Practice must also emerge from research. The two must be combined. Both with policy learning. I ask you to build cooperative and productive links. And thank you very much.